and I've enjoyed many of the discussions this morning and earlier this afternoon. I enjoyed some of Richard Dawkins' comment, and also a lecture given by Neil, uh, which I enjoyed immensely, but there's one minor point of disagreement. Uh, I think he got something factually incorrect, and that is he talked about the glories of the Arab civilization, about Baghdad, which I agree with wholeheartedly, but then he referred to Arabic numerals, that they invented the number system as we know it with zero and numbers. In fact, these should be called Indian numerals. <laughs> they, they actually originated in India in the second century AD and then were transmitted to the Arabs and from there to the, to the West. And Western scholars therefore refer to it as, as Arabic numerals. Um, but you know, that doesn't contradict the spirit of what you're saying, which I agree with. Now, regarding God, which is the main theme uh, of this conference, uh, I think the word is used in many different ways. On the one hand, there's the idea of a very abstract sense of, uh, what many of us scientists have, of the sense of wonder uh, we've experienced when contemplating the cosmos. In other words, God is synonymous with natural phenomena, uh, with the universe, if you like. And uh, this is a recurring theme in many Eastern philosoph philosophical traditions. And I can't find anything wrong with that, and I think many of you would agree. But then there's a notion of a personal God, that there's a, this guy, old man, watching us and who punishes us for our sins and rewards us, gives us brownie points for, for um, good deeds. And that I find hard to believe, and I'm sure that most of you here would agree with that. Now, I also want to talk about, um, what I'm going to mainly talk about is the origin of religious belief. Uh, what parts of the brain are involved? Obviously, the brain is involved in religious belief, but are some parts of the brain more involved in, than other parts? and also the evolutionary origins of religious belief. And let me say at the outset, I don't believe in intelligent design. I believe, uh, maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but essentially a random process of natural selection is what's involved in evolution. And I don't believe in intelligent design. And it's ironic that our president is, is championing this, this view of intelligent design, given that his own existence is a living negation of any such principle. <laughs> um, now, the other topic that came up repeatedly is the notion of consistency of belief. How can somebody be an eminent physicist, even logician like Kurt Gödel, uh, come to believe in, in, in something like God? So how can somebody hold inconsistent beliefs, even though the person may be extraordinarily intelligent? And I have a, an answer to that. I think that a consistency of belief, in fact, is the exception rather than the rule in human behavior. We have all these parallel brain mechanisms, modules, which are performing different computations, and they're approximately in coherence. And that's important, producing coherent behavior, important for survival, and that's why they, there's coherence. But sometimes they're out of sync, and that's why you get inconsistencies in belief systems. I'm reminded of, of, of um, Niels Bohr, who had a, a, a horseshoe on his door, and somebody asked him, my God, how, do you, how can you possibly have a horseshoe? You don't believe that, that it brings good luck? And he said, well, I don't believe in it, but it works anyway. Okay. <laughs> now, the most flagrant, the most flag. If you ex. <laughs> okay. Now, the most flagrant example of this is seen in neurology. And we've been studying patients with a disorder called anosognosia, where a patient has a right parietal damage, stroke affecting the left side of the body, complete paralysis of the left side of the body, including the left arm. This person is quite intelligent, engages in a conversation about politics, can play chess with you, and so on and so forth. But then you say, what about your arm? Does your left arm work? And the patient says, oh, it's fine. It works fine. Right? So here's a patient who's completely intelligent, denying something perfectly obvious, like the left arm being completely paralyzed. In extreme cases, you show his left arm to him or her and say, what is this? He says, oh, it's my mother's hand, or it's my father's hand. And you say, well, why do you think it's your father's hand? So, well, it's big and hairy, so it must be my father's hand. So here is somebody who is perfectly lucid and intelligent holding this absurd belief that their left arm is not paralyzed or belongs to somebody else. In fact, I saw a patient the other day, and, and, and she said, my left arm, this arm doesn't belong to me. Uh, it's not paralyzed. It's fine. Okay. Then I said, touch your left shoulder with your right hand. And of course, there's no problem. The right hand is fine, and he does that. Then I said, touch your right shoulder with your left hand. And he does this. 
Now, that's amazing because it shows that somebody in there knows she's paralyzed. Okay? This is an absolutely striking example of inconsistency in belief. Now, you may think this person denying paralysis or denial is a very rare neurological syndrome, but not all of us here. But in fact, it's extraordinarily common. All of you here, most of you here, engage in denial all the time. But let me give you a little proof of this. Somebody recently conducted a survey asking people, everybody, are you above average or below average in intelligence? 98% of people say they are above average in intelligence. And this is mathematically impossible because it's obviously a Gaussian curve. And what it shows is half of mankind is in denial about its stupidity. <laughs> this was painfully evident in our last presidential election, by the way. OK, so uh, now let's go to get to the neurology. And one, of the th one, of the group, one group of patients we have studied is split brain patients, or commissurotomy patients. These are people whose corpus callosum has been cut, and anterior commissure, and massa intermedia, whenever encountered. So essentially, you're, taking a, you're doing a karate chop right through the head and creating two human beings in one body, in one skull, two spheres of consciousness. Now, many experiments have done on, been done on these people, and I asked myself a very simple question. OK, you've created two people here. What about their personalities? Do they have different personalities? What about their aesthetic preferences? Does one like blondes and the other like brunettes, for example? One like chocolate and the other like vanilla? What, what happens? So we tried these experiments, and what we did was we had to first train the right hemisphere to communicate with us. In fact, the right hemisphere can read simple commands, simple words, simple sentences. And then you ask a question and say, point to a box, yes, no, I don't know. Because it can't talk. The right hemisphere cannot talk. But it can comprehend simple semantics, simple questions. Left hemisphere, of course, can talk. So you can present boxes, yes, no, I don't know. So we ask, for example, are you at Caltech? And the right hemisphere pointed to yes. Are you on the moon? It said no. Are you? Uh, uh, are you um, in California? I said, yes. Are you asleep? He said, no. Then I said, are you a woman? And the patient was male. And he pointed to yes, and then started chuckling and laughing. So at least the right hemisphere has a sense of humor. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now comes the big question. What if you ask, do you believe in God? So I said, do you believe in God? And the right hemisphere went straight to yes. Right? Ask the same question to the left hemisphere, yes, no, I don't know. It went to no, right? So here's a human being whose right hemisphere is an atheist, and left hemisphere, on the other hand, <laughs> believes in God. And this finding should have sent a tsunami through the theological community, but barely produced a ripple, because it raises all kinds of profound theological questions. If this person dies, what happens? Does one hem? <laughs> Does one hemisphere go to heaven and the other go to hell? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> now, now, the next group of patients we studied were patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. And it's been known for a long time, people with seizures originating in the temporal lobes, epileptic seizures. Normally, you think of epileptic seizures as being a grand mal seizure. And you have, a, you, know, you have a seizure involving the whole body. You stop breathing. You utter a loud cry, and you fall down. But in fact, there's a group of seizures, a kind of seizure called temporal lobe seizure, or psychomotor seizure, which is purely a mental seizure, an emotional seizure, but doesn't necessarily involve a bodily seizure. And what's astonishing, there are many symptoms of this, emotional upheavals and uh, extraordinarily emotionally loaded experiences, a turmoil of emotions that the patient experiences. But the most striking aspect of these people is not only during the seizures, but interictally, when they're not having seizures, they have extraordinarily they have tremendous religious experiences and mystical experiences. They say things like, during the seizure, I experience God. I see the meaning of the universe, the true meaning of the universe, for the first time in my life. Everything is deeply significant. I understand my place in the cosmic scheme of things. That's what they say. And this happens also in between seizures, but primarily during seizures. Sometimes they'll actually say, I'm talking to God, or God is talking to me. Now, why does this happen? Well, there's four or five hypotheses. One hypothesis is maybe God is visiting and coming to see them. And you can't discount this on, for any, on, on the basis of any scientific evidence, although I would say, you know, saying that God works in very strange ways. Uh, but it, I find it strange that she would manifest herself in temporal lobe seizures, only in epileptics. But, you know, we don't know. 
Okay? So, first of all, the idea that God visits you, and I can't disprove that. The second idea is they're just mad. You know, they're just nuts. They're crazy. Something is going on in the temporal lobes. They become crazy, and they believe in God or believe in something. Well, that doesn't work because uh, I've seen other crazy people, people who are schizophrenia, who really are crazy, and majority of them don't necessarily believe in God or become religious. Some of them do. They'll say, I'm Napoleon, or I'm God, or I'm George Bush, or whatever. Okay? But majority of them don't necessarily believe in God. But in temporal lobe seizures, a substantial proportion, maybe 30 to 40 percent, have this intense religious fervor and belief in God. The second hypothesis, third hypothesis, is that maybe there is this cauldron, given that it's limbic system where the seizures originate, and the limbic system is very much involved in emotions, there is this cauldron of emotions, this emotional turmoil in your mind, and then the left hemisphere kicks in. In the left hemisphere, we know from a number of experiments on split brain patients and indeed on stroke patients, is involved in confabulation. If something doesn't fit, doesn't make any sense, the left hemisphere tries to spin a yarn to try to make things more consistent. So maybe when there is some strange, something bizarre going on in your mind, which is otherwise inexplicable, the left hemisphere starts confabulating and saying, the only way I can make sense of this is there is a visitation from another dimension, i.e., maybe it's God is visiting me. Okay, in other words, God is the ultimate confabulation by the left hemisphere. Okay. Now, another hypothesis is, and I can't rule that out. That's a possibility. Another hypothesis is kindling. That is, when any one of you look at the world, you look at objects around you, look at people, what happens? The messages cascade from the retina into the visual areas of the brain, visual cortex, and about 20 or 30 visual areas in the brain, and you compute the statistics of the world. You look at features. You analyze the features. Finally, you recognize objects, and objects then produce the appropriate emotional experience. In other words, the amygdala, which is the gateway to the limbic system, performs an emotional surveillance and looks for emotional significance. If something like a predator or a prey or the dean or something very salient like that, <laughs> you're emotional or something sexual, you get emotionally aroused and you start sweating and your heart starts beating faster because of autonomic arousal that takes place and you're preparing the body for feeding, uh, feeding fleeing, fighting, or sexual behavior, as the saying goes. Okay. So all of this takes place instantaneously, very, very quickly. And maybe what's happened to these patients is because of the repeated volleys of temporal lobe seizures, some of these connections have been indiscriminately enhanced. And when that happens, everything becomes deeply significant and salient. So normally, when I look at this, you know, if I look at a pinup or I look at a lion, I get aroused. But I look at this, I don't get aroused by a bottle of water. But these people, because of the kindling, Everything and anything they look at is deeply significant. And they see infinity in a, in a grain of sand or whatever. And they see everything they look at is deeply profound and deeply significant. And this is akin to many, what many religious mystics talk about, seeing deep significance in all everything in the cosmos. Now, how do you test that idea? Well, we said, OK, let's measure their sweating. You can do this with a galvanic skin response, where the sweating changes. When you look at something significant, you look at uh, a, 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 a lion or a tiger, or you look at something sexually provocative, then you get a huge galvanic skin response. If you look at a table or a chair, your galvanic skin response is flat. You don't react. What happens in a temporal lobe epileptic? We said, well, if this hypothesis is correct, anything and everything should produce a big jolt in the, temp in the galvanic skin response. So we did this experiment. We showed them, of course, lions and tigers, they get a big galvanic skin response, or a pinup, they get a big, oh, I take that back. Lions and tigers, violent scenes, horrible scenes, they get a big galvanic skin response. But we show them things which are utterly trivial, like bottles of water or a shoe or a, a pen or something. Nothing happens, as in a normal person. In other words, the theory that this is just kindling and everything is deeply significant is disproved. In fact, when they look at sexually provocative images, they don't get a galvanic skin response, unlike most normal people. right? And this is consistent with the fact they actually have hyposexuality. Their libido is reduced in temporal of epilepsy. But now comes the important finding. When we showed them religious icons, like a Star of David, a cross, or a word God, or the word Mary, the word Jesus, there's a big jolt on the galvanic skin response. Showing, and what we said in this abstract of Society for Neuroscience about, what, eight, nine years ago now, that something is going on in the temporal lobes in temporal lobe epilepsy, and maybe in all of our temporal lobes, 
there's a group of neurons which is firing in abnormal manner, which makes you more prone to religious belief, okay, in believing in a, in a deity or in, in, in God or whatever. And this, these neurons are hyperactive in these people, hence the propensity to religious belief. That's all we said. In fact, at the end of the abstract, the last line was, this does not prove there's a God module in the brain. But the press got hold of this and went crazy and said, Ramachandran has discovered the God center in the brain. And in fact, the Bishop of Oxford was questioned about this. And he said, well, so what? It just shows that when God made us, he put an antenna in all our brains, and it just happens to be in the temporal lobes. Fine, OK? So anyway, and the, the, for some time in the internet, there was a talk about a G spot in the brain. <laughs> okay. All right, so now the question then is, why do, you have, why do you have this neural circuitry in your brain whose activity gives rise to religious belief? Finally, there are two possibilities. One is it's a spandrel. In other words, it's doing something else in the brain which has evolutionary benefit. I don't know what that might be, right? Belief and maybe, it, it, uh, I don't know. I don't want to even speculate. The other possibility is it was, in fact, selected for by natural selection because, in fact, uh, look at every religion, every society, every tribe in the world. They have some kind of religious belief. Uh, and this rituals, the belief in a hierarchy, the, the ritual chanting, the mantras, the dances, all of that confers a certain stability and order on society. And maybe that's what provided the selection pressure for the em emergence of religious belief and God. Finally, let me conclude by saying none of this has any bearing on whether God really exists or not. As I said before, this is all about how a religious belief originates in the brain, and that's all, that's all I have to say. Thank you. So do you have any, um, there will be some questions, and obviously Richard wants to ask them, could, could you just comment very quickly on the recent um, Time magazine or the book by Dean Hamer where he talks about God in the brain, the whole notion of that? I'm, I'm afraid I haven't read it. So okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll, we'll come back to that later then. Richard, do you want to? Just, just a simple factual question. Well, I, I, a simple factual question. Um, the temporal lobe epilepsy people showed a strong galvanic skin response with religious icons. Do you, you didn't say, I think, whether normal people do. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, when we look at normal people, you, well, I don't mean normal religious versus normal atheists, okay? There is that question. But when you look at uh, normal, just anybody, you find, in fact, a high response to violence and a high response to, especially high to sexual, but not very much to religious icons. In fact, you can even look at religious people, and you don't get that much of an enhancement in religious response compared to temporal of epileptics. So Charles Harper, could you introduce yourself, please? Ch Charles Harper, John Templeton Foundation. Rama, I love your talks. I want to challenge you on something that you jumped over very early on. Uh, you made a claim that it seemed obvious to you that, it was, that you couldn't have a person who was scientific and also believed in God, that it was inconsistent. And Only I said, a personal. Personal view of God. Okay, I, I want to challenge you on that. What actually from science, not from a kind of culture of science or philosophy of science or from scientific, scientism, but what actually from scientific research results would you cite to support that view? Well, I mean, this goes back to the notion of agnosticism, and somebody raised the point about teacups. Um, I think that. If I were to say there is a you know a dragon with spotted you know pink dragon with green spots uh, floating out there billions of miles away, and you you say I'm agnostic about it, I don't know. I mean the notion of a personal god has that same status, I think. Now if you're talking about an impersonal, abstract god like in Hindu philosophy, where they talk about Brahman, which is synonymous with the mystery of existence, as as, as Bertrand Russell said, that the fact that something exists rather than nothing is itself the greatest mystery of all. From that point of view, I am agnostic. But from the point of view of somebody watching you, yeah, I mean, everything we know in science, Occam's razor, you know, why would you want to postulate such an instance that Laplace said, or, or, or indeed Newton said when he said the hypothesis is non fingo right? Why would you want to postulate something like, like a personal God when there's nothing that demands the, the existence of something like that? Mm, 